Amen. Please turn to Matthew chapter 6 for our last visit to the Lord's Prayer. Hopefully without visitors this, uh, like we had at the 8 a.m. service of two little sparrows hopping around in the front and uh, giving us a little extra reason to pray, Lord, deliver us from evil. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a trade-off. We want good ventilation, but uh, preferably not little uh, bird visitors. We are in the final petition here in verse 13 of this magnificent model prayer. It's a shining weapon. It is a powerful arsenal that soldiers of Christ, the church militant, has turned to in every age for every battle that she has ever fought. The Lord's Prayer has proved sufficient ammunition. We come now to the sixth and final petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's John Bunyan's second most famous allegory, entitled The Holy War, one I strongly recommend that you read and that your family read, as we have done with our children. Listen to how Bunyan portrays the biblical reality of spiritual warfare as he begins. He writes, in this gallant country of universe, where there lies a pleasant, peaceful municipality called Mansoul. The picturesque architecture of this town, its convenient location, its superior advantages cannot be equaled under heaven. Once upon a time, a mighty giant named Diabolus, who would be Satan, right? Made an assault upon this famous town of Mansoul. He tried to take it and make it his own habitation. This giant was the terrible prince of darkness. He was originally one of the servants of King Shaddai, and that would be the Lord, right? Who had placed him in a very high and mighty position, knowing they had lost their positions and the king's favor forever. Diabolus and his rebels turned their pride into hatred against Shaddai and his son, whom, as you know, Bunyan goes on to describe as Prince Emmanuel, Jesus. They... Diabolus and his demons. They roamed about in fury from place to place in search of something that belonged to the king on which to take their revenge. At last, they happened to find the spacious country of universe. And they steered their course toward the famous town of Mansoul. Considering it to be one of the chief works and delights of King Shaddai, they decided to make an assault upon the town. When they found the place, they shouted horribly for joy and roared as a lion over its prey, saying, Now! We have found the prize and how to take revenge on King Shaddai for what he has done to us. So they called a council of war and considered what methods they should use to win this famous town of Mansoul for themselves. Aren't you glad Satan is less active today and we don't need to worry about that? <laughs> what a lie! Is Diabolus any less active today in these same schemes as it was from the beginning. Is he any less determined to assault your town of man soul, woman soul, boy soul, girl soul, teen soul? We open our Bibles and what do we find after two short chapters? Let me demonstrate in my thick Bible here. There are two chapters before the fall of perfect peace and absence of any conflict right about there and there are two chapters at the end revelation 21 and 22 in the new heavens and the new earth and the eternal state and uh, i do have an index by the way there's a little concordance in the back that doesn't count and those two chapters start about there everything else in between is one bloody gruesome carnage filled battle zone of warfare no Ceasefire. Yes, a climax at the cross, but still the conflict rages between the serpent and his seed and the woman and her seed, right? And no ceasefire until the very end. For still our ancient foe, we sing, don't we? Doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is none his equal. Nothing's changed from Bible times until now, beloved about this terrible triad of enemies that is waging war against our souls, right? Either keeping you unsaved if you're lost here this morning, or, for the believer, hindering your Christian growth, forever assaulting and assailing the life of the church. Is Satan any less satanic today? Is the world any less worldly? 
Is the flesh any less fleshly and enticing and deceptive and subtle and, and appealing? Beloved, I'm convinced that you and I live in an age of playground Christianity, not battleground Christianity. An age that the great missionary statesman to Africa and India, remember C.T. Studd, the once famous uh, British cricketer, over 100 years ago, he called it our age of chocolate soldiers instead of real ones. And as we look at the past 22 months of Christian capitulation to COVID tyranny, it has revealed this as well. But perhaps nothing reveals more our cavalier complacency and our spiritual dullness and our indifference to the raging battle like our prayerlessness, the weakness of our prayer lives. Let's play out the illustration here for a moment, if you will. The contrast between a playground mindset and a battleground mindset. Some of us who are older will have to recall those playgrounds, or if you have kids or grandkids, it's maybe not so far away. You're, when, especially think of those ultra secure uh, first world playgrounds where a child couldn't get injured if they tried, right? There's very little risk. I mean, there may be planes and ships and, and horses, but none of them is real because the battle isn't real, right? You just pretend, you just imagine and you practice maybe for, for some time long in the future. And you come when you want, and you go when you want on a playground, and you do as you feel. There's no sacrifice required. There's no commitment needed. It's just casual interests, because playgrounds are for playing. They're for children, not adults. If you're an adult there, and you think it's real, and you're like, bang, bang, wah, 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 you'll soon be sub- admitted, right, to a certain kind of institution, perhaps. However, a battleground is entirely different, as some of you know, who have a military background. Commitment is everything. Self-sacrifice will make or break the soldier. The risks are gigantic. The stakes are high. It's life or death. It's do or die. The planes, the ships, the horses, the weapons are real because the battle is real. It's not in the future. It's now. You don't decide when to come and when to go or what to do. You are under orders. You're bound by duty because, after all, playgrounds are for children. The battleground is for adults. And I ask you, what kind of prayer do you think the Lord's Prayer is here in Matthew 6? Has our captain, the Lord of hosts, and Christ Jesus given us a mere playground, peacetime, childish sort of prayer like it is so often treated? Or has he, in fact, given us a wartime, battleground, mature prayer for our entire Christian life? You know the answer. It's rightly been said, we will not know what prayer is for until we know that life is war. You ever heard that? Pacifist Christians treat prayer like a domestic intercom. I love this analogy. We use intercoms every day. Hey, honey, who's at the gate? Someone's buzzing, right? It's just ho-hum. Oh, it's another day. Okay, yeah, please come in. All right. Okay, no, we don't know you. Stay away. Okay, yes, Corneli, please come in. Okay, hey, son. All right, back from your errand. Forgot the remote. Okay, come in. Cool, fine, good, easy. No, the Bible tells us prayer is not some domestic intercom. It is an urgent wartime walkie-talkie. It is a two-way field radio for the front lines of kingdom conflict. We will not know what prayer is for until we know that life is war. Keep your armor bright, attend with constant care, still walking in your captain's sight and watching unto prayer. Pray, without ceasing pray, your captain gives the word. His summons cheerfully obey and call upon the Lord. To God your every want in instant prayer display. Pray, always pray and never faint. Pray, without ceasing pray. And then Wesley concludes in this hymn, From strength to strength go on, wrestle and fight and pray. Tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well-fought day. Let's read the passage now. Please stand, if you will, as we hear the text for our message today. Listen, as I read Matthew 6 from verse 7, just to get the context and remember where we have been. Matthew 6 from verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, what perfectly providential timing that we come to this final line of the prayer about temptation and evil as we head into the December holidays where we all can testify that Satan, Taylor, makes with laser sharp precision certain temptations for the holiday season. For each season of our lives, special occasions and opportunities where we can so easily stumble and fall. Our enemy has the most advanced of methods, millennia of experience, a supernatural technology, as it were, armed and aimed against us. But we rejoice to know the battle belongs to you. Even as we prepare for celebrating tonight, we pray even as we worship, enter into this Advent Christmas season, that you would lead us not into temptation. You deliver us from the evil one, that we would see your gospel get victory in our own hearts and minds and marriages and our homes and in our church. And even tonight, you promise us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who yearn for holiness, who strive for Christ's likeness. We are tired of sin, O oh Lord, and we want vict- more victory over temptation. Thank you for that promise that they, those who hunger shall be filled. Fill us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Reminding you where we have been so far, the first three petitions, verses 10 and 11, to, of course, as we learned in verse in the preface, uh, verse 9, to our exalted heavenly Father, all of the first three requests are outward focused, they're upward focused, they're heavenward focused, they're Godward focused, away from self, right? I love the way Ryle summarizes, J.C. Ryle, these first three petitions and how they could impact an entire country and a whole nation. Listen to this. He says, blessed indeed are those who Christians who have learned that God's name is far more honorable than their own or than any other earthly potentate, that God's kingdom is the only kingdom which shall stand forever, and that God's law is the rule to which all laws ought to be conformed. The more these things are understood and believed in a land, the happier that land will be. Would that include South Africa? Absolutely. And then we move to the fourth and fifth petitions we've seen in recent weeks. Praying, first of all, about our physical needs, daily bread, there in verse 11. And then last time in verse 12, our first of our spiritual needs for forgiveness. And now we come to the second spiritual need of protection. Think about it, friends. If we just saw in verse 12 that our past debts are forgiven and our past sin and guilt has been uh, pardoned by the Lord, do we care about our present and our future sins? Or do we believe in cheap grace and a hyper grace, antinomian, unbiblical mindset. Remember Romans chapter 6? Oh, shall we sin that grace may abound? To which the answer is, may it never be. The God who has forgiven us is the God who continues to cleanse and to wash and to purify and to grow and mature us. Lead us, Lord, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. My title this morning is A Soldier's Prayer. A soldier's prayer. Notice it's a prayer for protection. First we'll see it's praying against temptation, and then it's praying against the tempter. Two sides to this prayer for spiritual protection. First, praying against temptation, and then more briefly at the end, we'll look at praying against the tempter. Look at the text. First of all, praying against temptation. Verse 13 begins, and do not lead us into temptation. And we say, hold on, Houston, we have a problem. Because James chapter 1 says God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. Oh, so some scholars and some Christians will say, ah, so then Jesus must be saying, lead us not into trials or testing. Except that the same chapter, James 1, and many other places in the Bible show that God sends trials and sends testing. 
and we're to count it all joy, right? When you encounter various trials. So, what then are we actually supposed to pray here in this sixth and final petition? And to answer that, I believe in Matthew itself, the two critical cross-references, the strongest parallel passages, provide for us the answer. First of all, Matthew 26. Turn over there. We were just there a moment ago at the Lord's table. It's Gethsemane. It's the garden. It's the drowsy, dull, sleepy disciples. And what does Jesus say to them? Matthew 26, verse 40. Look there. Matthew 26, verse 40. Jesus came, comes to the disciples and he finds them sleeping. And he says to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and keep praying that you may not enter into what? Same word. Same Greek word. Same English translation. Temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why? And, and he repeats it three times over, doesn't he? As the story goes on to tell us. So, beloved, why? Why is alertness and vigilance so vital for the disciples? Well, because of exactly what happens moments later, in that same night, right? At Jesus' arrest, what happened? All the disciples, poof, gone, bolted. When Jesus needed them most, cowards instead of courageous. And then in the courtyard, around the fire, in front of a puny little servant girl, not once or twice, but three times. The leader of the apostles, Peter, does what? Denies his Lord. And then at the cross, only John pitches. We don't know of any of the other disciples showing up to stand by Jesus for those six hours of agony on Good Friday. And while his body's in the tomb, all we know is they were, the disciples were despairing and doubting, and the women were the first to show up at the tomb more hopeful than these unbelieving and anxious and fretful men. Spiritual failures in the face of temptation. Stumbling, defeated, because they wouldn't watch and pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil and from the evil one. Gurnall is a Puritan who wrote one of the finest books ever. I would say next to the Bible, the two best books ever written, at least in English, that you ought to put on your December reading list, whether you ever get my book or not, <laughs> is William Gurnall, this Christian's complete armor on Ephesians 6, and then Thomas Brooks, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, we did years ago in Ironman. Absolutely superb and scripture saturated. Listen to Gurnall. He says, the saint's sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. Every fly dares venture to creep on a sleepy lion. When was Samson's hair cut by Delilah? When he was sleeping. When was King Saul's spear stolen by David? While he was sleeping. When was Noah shamed? When, in a drunken sleep, right? When did Eutychus fall out of the window while Paul was preaching? While sleeping. Sounds almost like a movie title, right? While you were sleeping. <laughs> Christian, seek not yet repose. Cast thy dreams of ease away. Thou art in the midst of foes. Watch and pray. Principalities and power, mustering their unseen array. Wait for your unguarded hours. Watch and pray. Watch as if on that alone hung the issue of the day. Pray that help may be sent down. Watch and pray. Turn back to Matthew 6, to the Lord's Prayer. Back to our opening question here at this first point. What are we praying when we pray against temptation? Well, the answer must be related to what we just saw in Matthew 26 at Gethsemane. In other words, Lord, don't let us fail to watch and pray like the disciples did. Don't let us compromise to the point of denying you. Don't allow us to uh, apostatize. Notice, the Lord did not say that we should pray, don't tempt us. Never is God the tempter. We know that from the righteous, holy, pure, blameless, spotless character of God throughout the scriptures. But the second critical key cross-reference to know what we're praying for and lead us not into temptation is found in Matthew 4. Turn back a couple pages. Matthew 4, verse 1, the temptation of our Lord. How does the chapter begin? Matthew 4, verse 1. Look in your Bibles. 
Watch for the two different agents that are involved in the temptation in a very unequal, dissimilar, <laughs> unbalanced fashion. But there's two agents at work. Both of them are identified by that little English preposition, by, B-Y. Watch, Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by who? The Holy Spirit. This is God. God the Holy Spirit bringing Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by who? Someone very different. Someone very inferior. Someone created. Someone defiled. Someone wretched and filthy and evil. By the devil. Two different agents involved in the same event. This is no ordinary duel. Satan is God's tool. It's where the, so much of the charismatic movement has gotten it wrong, right? And giving way too much credit to Satan in such a very deceptive way that actually numbs them to the real attacks of Satan. God is sovereign, not Satan. God's will always prevails. No one can thwart his agenda. Not even the devil and his legion of demons, right? God is here in Matthew 4 testing his son, using the devil to serve that purpose. The Holy Spirit is the boss. The devil is the employee. Are you ready for this? Please listen. Temptation is always God-ordained. It is never God-inflicted. Temptation is always God-ordained. It is never God-inflicted. I love the way someone put it. God uses sin sinlessly. That's good, huh? God uses sin sinlessly. How about Joseph? The classic Old Testament story of God working out his sovereign will through responsible human choices and evil agents. Genesis chapter 50. Gen Joseph looks back and says to his wicked brothers, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Story of Job. Who did Satan have to get permission from before he could harass and haunt Job. God, right? Remember Luther's comment in Genesis chapter 3 where it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the animals the Lord has made. And Luther says, Remember, Christian, he's a devil, but he's God's devil. <laughs> he's a devil, but he's God's devil. And so look back at the Lord's prayer here. Lead us not into temptation. Perasmas in the Greek, a neutral word. It can be in the positive as a trial and a test from God. It can be in the negative as a temptation from the world, the flesh, and behind it all, the devil. God is the ultimate Lord, the first cause over all trials. But Satan is a secondary cause, the evil tempter and deceiver. And often at the same time, both agents are at work simultaneously, concurrently, right? During the same trial, the same bitter circumstances, the same heartache. Have we not seen Christians, two believers, going through the same virus, the same unemployment, the same bereavement, the same crisis, and one responds in the flesh sinfully, and it becomes a temptation, while the other responds well by faith, by grace, and it is a trial. What Satan wants to use, the same heartache or catastrophe or daily irritation and frustration. What Satan wants to use to harm you, God ordains to help you. What Satan wants to use to destroy you and to disprove you, God wants to use to prove your faith. So the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. The same knife that cuts a steak kills an innocent victim. Lead us not into temptation. What are we praying here? Let me give some other paraphrase that may help you. Father, don't let us turn your tests into Satan's temptations. Don't let the devil get a foothold, as the Bible says elsewhere. Keep us from sinful compromise. Lord, don't lead us into situations where we'll be too vulnerable for our faith at present. Don't expose us to more of the devil's onslaughts than we are ready for in your strength. Lead us not into hard testing. Our boys had a little child's book that they used to read at bedtime, and that's the way they paraphrased it, and that's, that's good exegesis. <laughs> Lead us not into hard testing. Beyond what we can bear, past our breaking point, Lord, you know my bridge has a weight limit. I don't know what it is, but you do. And all of this is pointing back to one text. Many of you know where we're going, aren't, aren't, don't, uh, don't you? We're praying, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Lord, you promised. 
you said explicitly, I'm just taking you at your word. I'm cashing in on your promise right now that you would not let us be tempted beyond what we could bear. Right? There's no temptation or trial test, same Greek word, that is but overtaking you, but what is common to man? And you won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But with the trial, we'll provide a way out so that you might endure and bear up under it. Oh, we don't like to pray those kind of prayers. We live in a microwave, take away, uh, you know, quick, easy, sort of uh, uh, impatient age. And we're being taught here to pray, Lord, give us endurance. Help us to persevere. Help us to remain steadfast and strong, courageous, and victorious in the face of suffering. Catechism puts it well. What do we pray for in the sixth petition? Answer, we pray that God would either keep us from being tempted to sin or support and deliver us when we are tempted. Have you noticed in the Psalms, David kind of prays this way often? And Asaph and the sons of Korah? I'll give you one example, Psalm 141. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. You notice how opposite this is to the modern heresy of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, of the, the false doctrine of positive confession and never speaking any negative words that might bring bad things into existence. Get ready, saints. Jesus is teaching us to pray a negative confession about ourselves. Lord, I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. Sadly, I'm afraid much of Christian praying today is the opposite. It's basically a celebrity update. Lord, aren't you glad for a, a hero and a stalwart like me on your side? I mean, aren't you thankful for such a spiritual superhero that's learned the formula and mastered the method and uh, performed the technique and says the right words and knows how to rub the genie bottle three times and get things from God and tell you how profoundly victorious and triumphant a Christian I am. Those are the most defeated believers of all, often proving to be unbelievers, in fact. And the Lord says now, we humbly pray, do we not sing? prone to, I had a Christian once, a Christian leader I was talking with, and their the wife actually, a little awkward, I try to be respectful, but the, this godly woman says, that's too negative, we shouldn't pray prone to wander. I said, can we have a Bible study? Can I show you a hundred different places in the Bible that we say, Lord, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, and here's my heart, oh, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. confession of our weakness. Otherwise, we're just like Peter, right? Uh, moments uh, earlier, right? Uh, uh, in the Gospels, to Jesus, even though all may fall away, right? I'll never fall away, even if I have to die with you. Uh, I will not deny you, Lord. Cock -a -doo -doo. Second time. Cock -a -doo -doo. Oh. The bell of his conscience was rung. The intoxicating wine of self-confidence. Instead of the sobering request of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Look into yourselves, lest you be tempted, Galatians 6. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Beloved, overconfidence makes you underprepared for temptation. Pride disarms you. Humility arms and equips you for the battle. Godward confidence, self-distrust, self-watchfulness prepares you to face the fiercest temptations. Ah, oh, we said, but what kind of temptations are we praying against and arming and preparing ourselves for? Well, exactly what we see all over Scripture, exactly what Jesus faced in his temptation back in Matthew 4, where Satan's threefold core strategy as the scripture tells us elsewhere is to go after the lusts of the flesh, right? What Bunyan calls the mouth gate into the city of man's soul. The pride of life, what Bunyan calls the ear gate of applause and human favor and approval. And then third, the lust of the eyes, right? What Bunyan calls the eye gate into man's soul. I found an old hymn, 1697, Johann Freistein. I don't know, maybe he's, sounds like, maybe he's 
South African for all we know. But it's, uh, uh, except I don't think there was Christianity here at the time much at that time. But from the Puritan era, and he goes through each of the three great, the fierce foes, the devil, world, and flesh. Listen. Watch against the devil's snares, lest to sleep he find thee. For indeed no pains he spares to deceive and blind thee. Satan's prey oft are they who secure our sleeping and no watch are keeping. Watch, let not the wicked world with its power defeat thee. Watch, lest with her pomp unfurled she betray and cheat thee. Watch and see, lest there be faithless friends to charm thee, who but seek to harm thee. Watch against thyself, my soul, lest with grace thou trifle. Let not self thy thoughts control, nor God's mercy stifle. Pride and sin lurk within, all thy hopes to scatter. Heed not when they flatter. Lead us not into temptation. Friends, how often do we fall because we're in the wrong place to start with? Remember the little boy, right? Mama couldn't find him. Willie, where are you? He says, I'm in the cupboard. I'm in the pantry. Willie, what are you doing there? I'm staring at the cookie jar. You know, the delicious mouth-watering biscuits. Willie, why are you doing that? I'm fighting temptation, Mama. How often are we with the wrong kind of friends, the wrong kind of places and people, entertainment choices, certain kinds of music and movies, social media, habits, perhaps delaying marriage, men staying single far too long? Perhaps the sixth petition includes prayers along these lines. Lord, lead us not into temptation through not being ready to cross death's cold river. What if today's my day, Lord? Am I ready for persecution, even martyrdom? Lord, you know what I can handle. Build spine, strengthen my resistance, prepare me for that evil hour, as Scripture describes it. Lord, lead me not into marital conflict I can't bear, sexual temptations where I might stumble, parental challenges beyond my breaking point, work pressures where I might snap beloved do you know the particular temptations of your season of life i prayed differently when i was 17 and i was saved for two years than when i was 27 and i'd been married for three years than when i was 37 and uh, this church was just getting started and now when i'm 47 do you know according to scripture and based on church history and based on wise rational, reasonable, sensible observations of yourself and your world and based on godly mentors in your life. Now, this stage, this season, newlyweds, single young men, an older couple, an elder, a deacon, a grandpa, a grandma, your stage, your season, in light of this book, what Satan's strategies are and how you might stumble and where the specific temptations might be and the minefields and the snares and the what he calls them uh, on the road, the holes, pit, pit holes, yeah. <laughs> Potholes, thank you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, don't let my flesh get me into such a bind, like agur. Remember Proverbs 30? That I'm too rich and I deny you, or too poor and steal from others. <laughs> Let's get personal for a minute. Don't let my new book go to my head. I think my odds of becoming a millionaire are extremely small. Uh, <laughs> Whatever it is, keep me humble, Lord, fixed on you and useful to your church. Lord, in line with Romans 13, help me make no provision for the flesh. To bounce my eyes at immodesty or sensuality. To flee the first hint of temptation. To not toy or linger with it at all. And beloved, by the way, this is not just an obsession with my own holiness and sanctification. But who cares about you and your spiritual growth? No. Notice, it's plural. Once more, isn't it? Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. It's biblical praying that wraps its arms around the whole church and all the family of God. For all the saints, as Paul puts it in his epistles. Lord, help us all with radical amputation as you've taught us to hack off the right arm or pluck out the right eye that might be causing us to stumble. Lord, help us all when we face hard testing, that we would not fail you through mismanaging our time and our priorities. Help us, Lord, to not overcommit. Help us to care for our physical fitness and health. Lord, 
keep us from the folly of not getting enough sleep. Help us, Lord, to uh, avoid not exercising discipline in our eating and drinking habits. Help us, Lord, with our daily devotional life or anything else that would invite temptation and sin into our souls. I have to share with you a taste of Matthew Henry's classic book. Again, it's online free. It's called A Method for Prayer. Unlike anything I've ever seen, he weaves together for this one phrase, lead us not into temptation, 25 different Bible verses. Here's a taste of this lost art of scripture-saturated prayer, the way the Puritans used to do it. I won't give the references, that would distract. And Lord, he says, for as much as they're in us, a bent to turn away from you, so that when our sins are forgiven, we are ready to turn back to folly, we pray that you will not only forgive us our debts, but take care of us, that we may not offend any more. Lord, lead us not into temptation. We know that no one can say when he is tempted that he is being tempted by God, for God himself tempts no one. But we know that God is able to make all grace abound to us at all times and to keep us, Lord, from stumbling and to present us blameless in your presence with great joy. Therefore, we pray, Lord, that you will never give us over to our own stubborn hearts to follow our own counsels, but restrain Satan, Lord, that roaring lion who goes about seeking to devour, and grant that we may not be ignorant of his schemes and his designs. Oh, let not Satan, Lord, have us to sift us like wheat, or however, let our faith not fail if he does. Let not the messengers of Satan, that thorn in the flesh, be permitted to harass us. But if they do, let your grace be sufficient, that where we are weak, there we may be strong. And may be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the God of peace, may he crush Satan under our feet and do it shortly. And since we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness. Let us be strong in you, Lord, in the strength of your might. Don't you want to pray more like that? I do. Bible, bleed, saturated prayers. Lead us not into temptation. Number two, we not only pray against temptation, but we pray against the tempter behind it all. Once more, the Bible lifts the veil, pulls back the curtain, unmasks the enemy exposes his strategy. From behind enemy lines, we have the inside scoop. We have intel, right? (laughs) Intelligence, a whistleblower, a tip-off. The reason temptation has such supernaturally successful force is because of the evil one behind it all. Lloyd-Jones puts it well. He says, I'm certain that one of the main causes of the ill state of the church today is the fact that the devil is being forgotten. All is attributed to us. We've all become so psychological in our attitude and thinking. This was like 60 years ago. Whoa. How much more psychologized is our world today? So man-centered, in other words, in our attitude and thinking, he says, we're ignorant of this, this great objective fact of the existence and the being and the nature of the devil, the adversary, the accuser, and his fiery darts. I'm afraid in our circles as well, and more reformed and non-charismatic churches, we're so afraid of sounding like charismatics because of their false angelology that we've pretty much ditched any angelology or concern about Satan at all. And so we come to the second prayer. Keep reading there in verse 13. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or is it the evil one? It's actually a small difference since the tempter is never far from temptation and behind all evil is the evil one. It's a package deal either way. To pray against the one is to pray against both. Evil and the evil one. But I do believe grammatically and contextually a better case can be made for the translation evil one. There's two contextual reasons. We've looked at them. Matthew 26 and Matthew 4, the strongest parallels Both would point to Satan as the assumed tempter, sifting his disciples and tempting the Lord. And then there's also, I think, two grammatical reasons why we should translate it as uh, deliver us from the evil one, when that word evil is not an adjective with another word like evil this or evil that. It's usually, in fact, in Matthew, it's always personal and it's masculine, the evil one. And also with that preposition, from evil normally refers to persons. Plus, you have strong parallels from the lips of our Lord the night before his cross over in John. Remember John 17? 
I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. In fact, the dark shadow of the devil, the, the ruler of this world, stalks across many of those chapters in the upper room and the teaching of Jesus in that final week of his passion. John 12, John 14, John 16, John 17. Can I give you a modern proof of the, uh, how effective the enemy is at making his threats look safe? One of you a few years ago handed me from one of the chief heretics on the continent of Africa, Pastor Chris Oyekolomi of Christ Embassy, has a free monthly devotional. And in the devotional, he teaches we should stop praying to be delivered from the evil one. It's no longer relevant for Christians because at the cross, Satan was defeated. And so this part of the Lord's Prayer is to be deleted. It's, it's redundant. It's not relevant. Christians are no longer needing to pray to be protected from the evil one or delivered from temptation. We have victory. All we just do is speak it and claim it and announce it. And lo and behold, why are those very people and those heretics the biggest captives of Satan? The ones who are most duped and defeated of all and often exposed to be frauds sooner rather than later. How Satan must smile, the wickedest of smiles. Nothing delights an enemy more than for your opponent to believe that you're no longer a threat. <laughs> so you let down your guard and you stop watching and praying. Look at the text there. It says, deliver us from the evil one. This Greek verb here, rescue us. From a fate we can't get ourselves out of is the idea. We're helpless on our own. Lord, snatch us, grab us, yank us away from the grip of the evil one and his evil ways before it is too late. There is such a rampant belief in the Christian church today that God helps those who help themselves. And so you and all your devices and all of your spiritual emotions and experiences and your uh, Christianese and your Bible language that you can rebuke the devil and you can exercise the devil and you can take on Satan and maybe God will help you. Wrong. In spiritual battle, you don't need help. You need a hero. God doesn't come to those who help themselves. He comes to those who at the end of themselves. <laughs> you don't need an assistant. You need a champion. <laughs> you don't need a little uh, lift. You need a deliverer. <laughs> you need a rescuer. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. As my grandpa used to say, I'm shut up to you, Lord. If you don't act, I'm done. Deliver us from the evil one. Fight for us. The battle belongs to you, Lord. Glory and power and dominion and honor are yours. Because we face such a dreaded foe, he wants to steal and kill and destroy. Listen to the godly realism of Pastor John Calvin. He writes, here we must carefully note that it is not in our power to engage that great warrior, the devil, in combat, or to bear his force and onslaught. Otherwise, it would be pointless or a mockery to ask of God what we already have in ourselves. <laughs> Talks about those who have this self-assurance. Uh, have no idea the foe that we're up against. He says, with what a ferocious and well-equipped enemy they have to deal. Now we seek to be freed from his power as from the jaws of a mad and raging lion. If the Lord did not snatch us from the midst of death, we could not help being immediately torn to pieces by his fangs and his claws and swallowed down his throat. <laughs> Blows me away how... So much of the modern charismatic movement says that the Puritans and the old writers didn't believe in the Holy Spirit and didn't understand spiritual battle like we do today. What a lie from the pit of hell. They could run circles around you in their biblical theology of Satan and the demons, and you are child's play with your little infant toys and your little baby cot compared to the depth of awareness of our forefathers had about the real battle. Old Book of Common Prayer. Helpful here. Deliver us, Lord, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from all blindness of heart, Lord, from pride and vainglory and hypocrisy, from envy and hatred and malice and all uncharitableness. Deliver us, Lord, from fornication and all other deadly sin and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. <laughs> Deliver us, Lord, from sudden Unexpected death, an unprepared for departure from this world sooner than I thought it would be. 
Deliver us, Lord, from a hardness of heart and a contempt of thy word and thy commandment. O Lord, deliver us. I wonder how much of the modern church's failure in the last 22 months to stand against tyranny goes, comes down to this one thing, underestimating the enemy. Failure to recognize the spiritual battle. Remember July 2020 last year when at last, thankfully, MacArthur and the elders of grace, long before any vaccine mandates, came out with a statement because they knew their Bible and they saw what was coming. It's in my book as well. I, I quote, Christ is always faithful and true. Human governments are not so trustworthy. Scripture says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5. Scripture says he, Satan, is the ruler of this world, meaning he wields power and influence through political systems of this age. Many references are given in Scripture. Jesus said of Satan, he's a liar and the father of lies. And so, history, I quote, is full of painful reminders that government power is easily and frequently abused for evil purposes. I just heard this morning in New Zealand now, they say they can force their way into your home and vax you. I, I must confess, even still, after all the battles we've fought and the stands that churches like ours, by the grace of God and blessed with the elders he has given us and the members of this church, I am still underestimating Satan. And I still find myself, and I bet I'm not the only one in this room, saying, serious, like now, in the 21st century, like who do they think they are? They are pawns of Satan. The devil is real. When will we wake up? So the statement concludes. Politicians may manipulate statistics and the media can cover up or camouflage inconvenient truths. So, says MacArthur and the Grace Elders, a discerning church cannot passively or automatically comply if the government orders a shutdown of congregational meetings, even if the reason given is a concern for public health and safety. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from the evil one. Any other Old Testament saint come to mind where God handed him over to Satan to ravage and wreck his life and take everything from him except a nagging wife? <laughs> All to prove that Job was not a fair-weather friend and that Job didn't just serve the Lord when he blessed him, but that Job could say, even though he slay me, yet I will trust him. To prove that the faith of the believer is unbreakable. That saving faith in the true child of God is invincible because God himself holds him. And no one can snatch him from the Lord's hand. And God will not lead us into temptation. He will deliver us from evil. Luther summarizes well the sixth petition in that little booklet he wrote to his barber, remember, called uh, How to Pray. Dear Lord God, Father, keep us brave and alert fervent and eager in the use of your word and service, lest we become complacent, lazy, or sluggish, as if we had need of nothing more, so that the fierce devil suddenly is able to catch us by surprise. Grant us wisdom and power, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, so that as good soldiers we can conquer after resisting him. We have five minutes left for a reason. You should be wondering, what about this doxology? It's probably in brackets in your Bible. It dates back to ancient history, early church liturgy. It's biblically true. There's many other scriptures that teach this. It's a rich part of the history of our forefathers in the faith. However, <laughs> it's probably not in the original. Matthew probably didn't write it. It's not found in any of the earliest Greek manuscripts. not in any of the earliest commentaries on the New Testament. It's not found in Luke 11, the parallel to the Lord's Prayer. But there's no question, it's all true. God deserves all the kingdom, all the power, all the glory, all the time, forever and amen. So there's no reason we ought not to keep singing and praying this doxology. Unless, hear this, you want to do away with all human words in any human prayers in response to God's word. I don't think we're ready to do that. <laughs> right? And so they responded to the Lord's Prayer with some of these, with this now famous, and rightly so, uh, closing uh, doxology or conclusion. It's in the Catechism. What does the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teach us? Answer, it teaches us to take our encouragement and prayer from God only, 
and in our prayers to praise him, ascribing kingdom and power and glory to him. And in the testimony of our desire and assurance to be heard, we say, Amen. Some of you were influenced by Martin Holt's ministry in this land. And I still remember he created a kind of culture around him and the churches where he served as pastor and the annual ministers' conferences. And I miss that. Maybe we can work on that here. It's not required biblically, but it fits with this word, Amen. And it flows out of a biblical understanding. Verily, verily, truly, truly, Jesus loved to repeat it. And so when Pastor Martin would be done praying, his habit, remember, it would be, Amen. And everyone else was like, Amen. <laughs> we believe this. We'll die for this. It's true. We're not just playing games. It's real. God wants his name to be hallowed. And when we pray it, we say, Amen. God wants his will to be done. And we pray it and we say, it is true. God wants his kingdom to come. And we pray it with confidence. God wants to supply our daily bread. And we ask him with an amen. God wants to pardon our sins as we pardon others. And we pray it with a firm amen. And God wants to not lead us in a temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And all God's people said, <laughs> amen. <laughs> I love the way Matthew Henry ties this doxology, this concluding extra-biblical phrase back into those first three petitions. He says, Father in heaven, let your kingdom come, for yours is the kingdom. You are God in heaven and you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. And Lord, let your will be done, for yours is the power. And there's nothing too hard for you. And Lord, let your name be sanctified, for yours is is the name above all names, and your glory is above the heavens. So to all of this, we cry out, it is true. Let's pray. Indeed, our Father, we praise you that you have not left us speechless when we pray, and that you rebuke our prayerlessness, you inspire and invite and motivate and encourage our prayerfulness with words. You give us truths and language to bring to our Heavenly Father, which came from you in the first place. And we know you're eager to hear, your delight to answer. Forgive us, Lord, for all the other lesser things that fill our prayer lives and for all our failure to pray. Teach us, O oh Lord, to pray and live and believe and sing and desire more along these lines. Lord, that you would be made more famous. That your kingdom and your rule and your reign in our hearts and our lives and our homes and our church and our world would prevail. That your will would be done more in a heavenly way on this broken and fallen earth. And that, Lord, you would. You know the needs of each of my brothers and sisters here in this room this hour. Supply their daily bread, our faithful provider. And, Lord, do forgive and pardon our many, countless sins as we prove our faith and show your work in our lives and our forgiveness of those who sinned against us. And do not lead us, Lord, in temptation. You know we are prone to wander. Grow us in holiness. Strengthen our resistance. Lord, do not lead us into hard testing beyond what we can bear, as you have promised. But deliver us, Lord. Rescue us from all evil, from the evil one himself. Because yours is the kingdom, all the power, and all the glory for all ages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.